Welcome to this session of the Hinkai Talks. Um, Hinkai Talks is a series of webinars where Hinkai aims to connect its membership with the broader international higher education quality assurance community to discuss some of the, uh, the pressing issues that we are facing today. We bring together international experts, uh, international practitioners to share insights, challenges, best practice, uh, proposed solutions, uh, to ensure that higher education and quality assurance uh, continues to remain relevant and, and to serve at its best uh, our increasingly interconnected communities. My name is Fabrizio Trefiro. I'm an INCA board member. I'm head of international cooperation and quality reviews at ECTIS UK ENIC, which is the UK National Qualification Recognition Body, and I will be chairing today's session. This session looks at the issue of academic integrity, uh, and today's growing um, uh, threat to the confidence that can be placed uh, in the value of higher education qualifications. And we will address uh, this uh, issue from different perspectives, that of quality assurance bodies and regulators, that of education institutions, and that of credential evaluators. So I'm delighted to introduce our excellent panelists, um, Maraid Boland, Senior Management, Academic Integrity, Regulation and Strategic Partnerships at Quality and Qualifications Ireland, QQI, one of uh, the founding agency of the Global Academic, um, Academic Integrity Network Initiative. Uh, Helen Gniel, Director of Higher Education Integrity at the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, TEXA in Australia, another uh, founding agency of the GAIN Initiative. Salim Razi, Associate Prof Professor in the English Language Teaching Department of Kanakale on Seki Smart University in Turkey, and also a founder board member of the European Network for Academic Integrity. And my colleague Chris Lyons, Head of External Engagement at UK ENIC, and a board member of TICEP, which is the Association for International Credential Evaluation Professional, where it chairs the Committee for Standards and Quality. So the way it will work is that I will invite each of the panelists in turn to briefly introduce their organization and their experience with the issue of academic integrity. We will then explore further in discussion some of the recurrent and emerging challenges and existing and developing solutions and initiatives. Um, but before we start, uh, a, a few words about uh, housekeeping. We have muted all your microphones to help with the smooth running of the event, and your cameras have also been disabled, so you can relax. But we are very keen to hear from you, so please do use the quality the, the Q and A function to raise any questions or any comment you may have at any time. Uh, these are intended to be in, in interactive sessions. We're very keen to engage in discussion with our participants, and it is a great occasion for all of you to engage on a topical issue uh, with some of the leading experts in the field. Also, uh, I should remind you that the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available for free access after the event. Last but not least, I would also like to thank Beatrice and Maria at the Hinkway Secretariat, who in the background are making sure that everything runs smoothly. And now, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to the floor, uh, Maraid Boland. Over to you, Maraid. Thanks, Fabrizio. Uh, just grappling here with sharing my screen, but I think that you should all see it now, and hopefully I'll manage to switch smoothly between slides as well. So, uh, first of all, thank you to Inquahi for having me here today to talk to you about two things. Um, so, first of all, the Irish context and the Irish approach to uh, academic integrity, and second of all, the Global Academic Integrity Network. And I'm delighted to be here with Helen Ganeel from TEXA, uh, QQI's partner and co-founder of GAIN, uh, to tell you about that. And hopefully some of you after this uh, talk will decide to join us in the Global Academic Integrity Network. So I'm just going to start off um, by talking about QQI um, and I suppose our role in protecting academic integrity and the key messages that I'd like to give you from this presentation um, and the key goals I suppose that QQI has in terms of protecting academic integrity and working uh, with, with other regulators through GAIN is um, I suppose first of all to protect, to protect our national qualification systems and our learners. Um, to disrupt the uh, business models of contract cheating services and other bad actors that facilitate academic fraud, 
And I suppose really the key message going away from today that I would like you to have is we really all need to work in partnership at national and at global levels to, to support this work. So just to, to set the scene, um, I've drawn together a couple of examples of uh, contract cheating service provider um, ads and, and sites. So you can see here that the breadth of ways in which contract cheating uh, providers um, sell their wares online. I should say, first of all, when I, when I talk about contract cheating, I'm talking about commercial contract cheating. Um, and, and, and by contract cheating, I mean the facilitation of um, cheating by, by learners. Um, so we're primarily looking here at kind of large scale commercial operations. You can see here an example of in the top left hand corner of a website um, and quite disingenuously, this website is offering plagiarism free guarantee because of course, if you have bespoke essays produced by a contract cheating service, they're not going to be picked up by plagiarism detection software like Turnitin. Um, we've got an example on that slide too of a, um, the infiltration of a student's um, WhatsApp um, by a contract cheating service provider, so direct marketing. Um, and you can see that, you know, Instagram, uh, for example, you can see on Twitter, um, somebody has, has uh, indicated that they have an assignment due and that they're stressed. And you can see immediately there are responses there from um, contract cheating service providers. So moving on, so where, where does QQI sit in this? So I should say QQI is a quality assurance agency. It's the, national, the Irish National Quality Assurance Agency across further and higher education and training. It's, a, it's the National Qualifications Authority and it is a statutory awarding body. We validate programmes and we make the awards um, linked to those programmes within the, the Irish National Framework of Qualifications. But in 2019, QQI was awarded a new statutory function following the amendment of its legislation. So that amended, amendment created new criminal offences with regard to facilitating and promoting academic cheating. And that's within further vocational education and training and higher education. Um, um, and that, I suppose, it, th there were new responsibilities for QQI there as prosecutor of those offences. That was great. Um, and I suppose that, that really, um, Put a, put a put a new focus on contract cheating and academic integrity within the Irish education system. But it's really important to emphasise that legislation in and of itself is not a silver bullet. Legislation is never going to be the solution. Um, and I suppose we were really conscious of that even before this legislation was enacted. Um, so what QQI has done is I suppose we, we have two complementary and mutually supportive strands of work within our organisation, focusing on regulation and implementing that legislation and on the enhancement side of things. So I think my colleague Sue Hackett is here today and Sue is our um, Academic Integrity Enhancement Manager and Manager of our National Academic Integrity Network, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I suppose we really looked at how we could leverage our role in, in all of the three um, main functions that we have. So incorporating academic integrity considerations within um, our, within our, our, our um, quality assurance processes, um, and, and I suppose using our function as custodian of the Irish National Framework of Qualifications to protect the integrity of war awards within that framework. In implementing the legislation, I suppose that the, the underpinning principles that we have are, as I said already, partnership and shared responsibility, and I'll come back to that in a moment, institutional autonomy, and we very much, that links back to partnership, we very much look to um, the universities and the other statutory awarding bodies in the state as partners in implementing this, this approach um, and other, other providers of education in terms of how um, they ensure that their internal quality assurance systems are, um, are support integrity and, and enhance cultures of integrity within the institutions. And then I suppose proportionality and, and fairness in terms of how we implement it. I've just quoted from QQI's current statement of strategy just to emphasize the partnership strand there again so you can see that that's a really important part of how we work. So like I said, um, in 2019, we were conscious legis legislation would not be the solution or, or the solution in and of itself. So immediately in, or, or quite soon after the enactment of that legislation, we established um, the National Academic Integrity Network, which is a peer-driven organization 
uh, or collective of um, providers and a number of other important stakeholders within the system, including um, staff or student representatives. Um, and that that network um, basically they they work to enhance um, to maintain and enhance cultures of academic integrity within our education institutions. They do that by providing CPD and by producing resources. And I've included a link to the National Academic Integrity Network website, which you can visit and, and see some of those resources. Um, I suppose there are other really important partners at a national level, including advertising and publishing platforms with whom we have established reporting relationships. So we monitor their, their platforms and we, um, we, they, they remove infringing content for us. Um, also professional statutory and regulatory bodies in terms of, of, of how we cooperate with them and, and their, their, um, their, you know, they, I suppose their role in ensuring professional in integrity. So I know I'm, 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 I'm just allow, going to allow you to, to read that and I'm just going to move on very quickly to then the national into the global. So um, in terms of, of partnership at a global level, I suppose um, just to start off by saying that um, we had 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 from, I suppose, from very shortly after the enactment of our legislation, we had had really fruitful um, discussions and exchanges um, and partnership with TEXA, um, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards uh, Agency in Australia, because I suppose we had an exist, we had existing co cooperation and engagement there through our Memorandum of Understanding. Um, similar legislation was underway in TEXA and was passed, and I, I think I'm right in saying in 20. 21 Helen but you can correct me if, if I'm wrong there um, and we had sim we had, I suppose we had similar roles and similar um, remits and functions so we were I suppose we were able to talk about what was working in our individual individual jurisdictions and what we could potentially take on board and and, and uh, adapt to suit our contexts um, but I suppose while that was really really helpful to, to work together bilaterally um, we were we were aware that actually contract cheating and other forms of academic misconduct and fraud are global issues and the more partners that we had on board in this um, in these endeavors the better um, it, it's it, it really is a problem contract cheating and academic fraud it's a problem that transcends jurisdictions and we need to, to I suppose to look at how we can um, form common approaches to, um, to to disrupting the business models of contract cheating providers. Um, so with that in mind, um, we began uh, working to put, to draw together other regulators and quality and integrity agencies with an interest and a remit in academic integrity to form the Global Academic Integrity Network. And we launched that network on the 18th of October in Dublin. Um, initially at the, uh, at the launch of the network, we had 14 organizations on board and we now have 26, so we are growing rapidly. And I've just included there an overview of the current membership of, um, of GAIN. Um, and you can see it truly is global, but we are really keen to keep growing and keep expanding that, that network so that we, we, we really do have representation from, um, from, from, from across all continents. You can see here that we do have endorsement from, um, from ENQA, um, from ENAI, um, the, the European Network of Academic Integrity, and from the Council of Europe Edinet platform. And you can see here, this was on the day of the launch, a selection of members from GAIN. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. I've, I've included some links at the end of my presentation so you can visit the Global Ac Academic Integrity Network site. Um, and I know Helen is going to tell you more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mairead. Uh, really, you got up got us off to a great start and really interested to to hear about the GATE initiative and uh, so over to Helen who was all, uh, from Texas who, who is uh, the other agency which has played a key role in developing the GATE initiative over to you get Helen thanks Fabrizio hi everybody good morning or afternoon or evening depending on where you are um, I'm worried that I won't um, be able to match Marae's technical skills that was very impressive seamless transition to sharing. Um, can you see my screen and is it in presentation mode? Yes, okay, great. Um, so look, I'm from TEXA, Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency in Australia. Mairead's given you a bit of a rundown of GAIN and our partnership. 
I'll give you a brief whistle stop tour of uh, how of Texas journey, I suppose, to get there. Um, and this has been a long journey for Texa. We had a massive scandal in Australia nearly 10 years ago now when a contract cheating website was exposed by investigative journalists. And it was a really major news story in Australia. There was significant pressure on the government um, to do something. And particularly because we did see as a result of that a decrease in enrolment from international students, which is a main export for Australia. Um, so Texa wrote to all higher education providers, reviewed their submissions and reported to the government on the initial responses and committed in 2016 to developing further support resources um, and an increased focus on how providers were ensuring academic integrity during our regulatory assessment. In 2017, Texa published the Good Practice Note addressing contract cheating to safeguard academic integrity. Um, and that brought together a lot of good practice examples from those submissions back in 2015 and 2016. And in 2018, the government recognised the central role that Texa could play and gave the agency additional funding to take on a national role tackling contract cheating and academic integrity. And in 2019, um, some of that funding was used to run a series of workshops right around Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and also in 2020, um, Inquahe provided Texa with some funding to develop a toolkit to support quality assurance agencies around the world, um, sharing the lessons that Texa had learned about working in partnership with our sector. As Mairead said, um, is also the same in Ireland. The partnership is a really key component of how Texa is trying to address this issue. A couple of other big things happened in 2020. So that was when the government passed legislation and also when the government established or provided the funding to establish the Higher Education Integrity Unit that I lead at Texa. So the legislation that's about two and a half years old now makes it an offence to provide or advertise academic cheating services the students studying for an Australian Higher Education Award. The legislation captures those who provide the cheating services. Students are not captured by our legislation, but they remain accountable to their institution. And one of the important um, parts of Australia's legislation and the way it's crafted is that the offences and penalties apply whether the services are operated from Australia or from overseas. And we do know from our research that the majority of these um, cheating websites are operated offshore. The legislation creates penalties of up to two years in jail or $110,000 fine in Australian dollars. Um, but we also have another part of our website, of our legislation that allows us to take out injunctions to block access to the website. So that's what we think of as our, um, I guess, our enforcement. Uh, but as Mairead said, we were also really conscious that legislation is not going to be a silver bullet. You can't prosecute your way out of a problem that is as complex and as multifaceted as commercial cheating. Um, so we also have um, a large body of our work that's about education and about protection. So we, we maintain a database of websites that offer cheating services. There's about 3,000 websites on that database and only around 600 of those websites are targeting students studying with an Australian provider. So that gives you a good insight immediately into the global scale of the problem. Um, Australia is a reasonably small market compared to some others. Um, and we found evidence of cheating websites targeting students in every jurisdiction that we've ever had to look. So it truly is a global problem. Um, a lot of our detection comes from web traffic analytics and we use that data for triaging so that we can work out which are the most uh, popular websites that are receiving traffic from Australia. So using our enforcement powers, in the last two years, we've blocked over 150 websites, uh, and that accounts for about 70% of all of the Australian internet traffic going to these contract cheating websites. Um, we'll be blocking the next set in April. So the great thing about the web traffic analytics is it's real time. So we can watch, we can block the most popular websites. We need leave around four months um, to work out who becomes the big players in the market, and then we block them the next time around. Um, like Mairead, we've been working with um, social media companies and advertising platforms. So we're nearing 800 posts, profiles, pages and channels that have been removed from social media. And we combine those two initiatives. So when we block a website, 
uh, we block their social media at the same time. So we sort of disable at once their social media and web traffic from Australia. But the education is really the most crucial part um, of our activity. Um, we think of education in terms of, of providers, and by that I guess I mean things like management and the people who sit on academic board, um, education of academic and professional staff, education resources for students, but also for government colleagues. We do quite a lot of outreach just to other government agencies to help them understand um, how the risks posed by contract cheating actually flow on to a whole range of other government activities, including, for example, um, foreign interference, um, national security, cyber security, all of these things are closely linked to um, academic cheating because students are essentially becoming vulnerable to blackmail for life. Um, and they may then go into senior positions within government with that threat hanging over their head. And additionally, students handing over the login details for um, the learning management system are essentially creating a massive cyber threat for their institution. So we're trying to work with the government leads on those areas as well. Um, the type of educative resources we create, I'll pop some links at the end of my slides as well for when they're shared, but you could just Google Texa Academic Cheating, but there's Toolkit, we run workshops, webinars, we're about to launch a detection masterclass for uh, Australian higher education staff that's been designed by some of the world's leading experts. Um, and we also run advertisements aimed at students on social media, alerting them to the threats that they're um, opening themselves up to, such as having their visa cancelled, failing their course and being blackmailed. So the national partnership approach is really crucial. I often talk about this Venn diagram where we have the institutions, TEXA and students. Um, and so for institutions, it's about supporting them and making sure they understand their responsibilities to provide leadership and resourcing, to have effective policies and procedures, um, to train and support both students and staff, to maintain assessment integrity and assessment authenticity. And for students, uh, it's about their attitudes, their behaviours, their personal integrity, and also the student leaders. And we encourage institutions to really think about how they can best work with the students in their institutions and really engage them in meaningful conversations about academic integrity regularly, not just once when they start their studies, but really touch and base with them throughout their academic journey. And for us as, as the regulator, we have our legislation. Um, we, we spend a lot of time, energy and resource enforcing it. Um, we have our regulations that providers have to uphold. We undertake legal action where we have to against providers of cheating services. And we see our role as that, as that, as that crucial kind of overarching support to make sure that providers that are smaller or less resourced or less mature um, can also access all the best resources and up-to-date best practice. So um, Texer, of course, sits you know, quite isolated all alone at the bottom of the globe. So our partnership um, with QQI has just been absolutely um, game changing for us. And so together um, we moved to yeah, embed the global academic approach that uh, Mairead was talking about through the Global Academic Integrity Network. Um, and so, that, so I guess the aim, and I, I've taken this from the terms of reference, to provide an international platform and coordinating structure for discussion, collaboration, and information sharing in relation to commercial contract feeding services. We all truly are part of a global system. Our graduates go everywhere to work, our academics come from all over the world, our researchers collaborate all over the world. So this truly does require global cooperation. Um, one of the, the fantastic things about um, the current members of GAIN and hopefully, you know, when we continue to grow and get more members is the breadth of expertise and experience that we're starting to get. So there's quality assurance agencies, but also qualifications agencies and academic recognition bodies. Um, there's, there's organizations that cover higher education and also further in vocational education. Um, and through the terms of reference, what we've identified that we really want to achieve is to explore overarching approaches to prevention, to share information on emerging threats, to highlight the reputational risk. Um, I feel that Australia has a particularly tough lesson that we learned to share there. And it's really important to remember that even though the number of students may be small as a percentage, there's a really disproportionate effect on the quality and the reputation of the higher education globally and nationally. Um, we aim to agree and implement a shared communication strategy 
and disrupt the business model through global collaboration and calls for action. Many of the platforms that enable the commercial cheating industry to flourish are global platforms. So having that global voice to call for action, I think is really important. We meet quarterly um, and we have a focus topic for each meeting. So a couple of recent examples um, where we've had a guest speak and talk about other types of academic fraud and really placing this in the context of the broader notion of academic fraud. And also at our previous meeting, um, talking about ChatGPT, um, how our different agencies were seeing that and, emerge, and responding to it, um, and just, yeah, so valuable to get that global perspective. So as Mairead said, we really welcome new members and would love to have you join us. Thanks, Fabrizio. Thank you very much, Helen. That, that is really interesting and um, touched upon a number of issues that <clears throat> I'd love to follow up later on. And uh, uh, but a, a quick question now. So, if uh, how do um, interested parties can engage with with gain? Say, if there's a mum want to to engage with gain, uh, what, what does what does they need to do? So the best way is to go to the website. I think Marae, which is globalacademicintegrity.network. Pop that in the chat, um, and there's a form there to submit an expression of interest, and then we'll be in touch. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Helen. Sorry, and, Rita, I was going to say, yeah. um, you know, we, we've also been saying we could, we, we're happy to run other presentations, you know, so if people want to get a, a group from their organisation together, because they want other people in their organisation to understand what the network is, we're really happy to facilitate that as well. That's great. And uh, um, another, another thing before uh, inviting Salim to um, take the floor, um, what kind of, uh, um, you outlined some of the, the things that you've been doing. Uh, it looks like that at the moment is very much around uh, um, sharing experiences, uh, coordinating activities. Um, what, what type of initiatives are, are you planning to undertake in the short term as a, as a network, other than uh, 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 being a platform for sharing experiences? Or is it too early? Do you want to jump in, Ray? Yeah, I can. I can come in there. So I suppose one of the things that we would see ourselves um, facilitating is calls to action, as as uh, Helen referenced within the terms of reference. So looking at collective statements from gain members to encourage, I suppose, parties whose who who can who, whose platforms can be used by bad actors. Um, to 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 work with us. So I'm thinking. You know, we're thinking of operations like. Play, payment platforms, social media platforms, advertising platforms, because as, as you've seen with the advertising platforms, at least on the social media platforms, um, there, there, is a, there is a lot of, of, of advertising of um, contract cheating services on those, um, on those platforms. And, and those outfits are very targeted and very, I suppose, insidious and, and clever in how they, they target students and in the language they use. So, it really is important that those platforms work with us to remove any any content um, of that sort. Thank you very much, uh, Mairead. Now, there is a question before inviting Salim. There is a question which perhaps we can take now. Um, the question is, uh, um, uh, where has he gone? There was a question about whether the, um, you knew whether there were other countries where uh, contract cheating was being made illegal. Or is it only Australia and, uh, and Ireland for the time being? I can actually take that very briefly. Um, I actually referenced a paper that Dr. Sarah Eaton from the University of Calgary um, and Alicia Adlington from, from the University of Calgary um, wrote early last year that actually includes a really helpful overview of jurisdictions in which um, legislation cr um, criminalising contract cheating has been enacted. That list is now a little dated because obviously um, England has, has joined and I know that there are plans underway to um, to enact legislation in other jurisdictions as well. Um, but but no, I mean I I know also in Austria there there is legislation um, for for contract cheating. Um, I think Montenegro also a, a number of European countries. Okay, that's great, excellent. There's another question, but I'll take later. Uh, uh, now I'll invite Salim out to take the floor. Um, Ellen, you mentioned very importantly uh, the key role, something that I'd like to explore further, of uh, education in terms of raising awareness am amongst key stakeholders, particularly higher education institutions and students about 
the danger of uh, contract, contract cheating and possibly also best practice in uh, teaching and learning. And I'm sure Salim will address some of these uh, these questions. Salim, over to you. Oh, thank you, Fabrizio, and thank you, Marit and Helen, uh, for the uh, presentation. Uh, please let me show you my screen. Hope you are able to see my presentation. Indeed, uh, uh, in my section, I'd like to focus on uh, our project that we call as Facing Academic Integrity Threats because it's highly relevant to the topic from a pedagogical perspective. Uh, so I'd like to provide a basic uh, overview of the project to you, in addition to our responsibilities in the project. Uh, however, before I do this, uh, in, in the previous sessions, we mainly focus on contract cheating and we will be addressing contract cheating as a component, as an academic uh, misconduct type under uh, academic integrity. So uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, we all understand the, sa the same thing from academic integrity. So provide a basic definition of academic integrity at the first stage. Uh, so when we ask the question, what we mean by academic integrity, indeed, uh, I'll be making a reference to uh, the definition uh, from European Network for Academic Integrity from the uh, INAI glossary. Here it says, uh, compliance with ethical and professional principles, standards, practices and consistent system of values that serves as guidance for making decisions and taking actions in education, research and scholarship. So. We understand that any type of educational activity, including education, research and scholarship, which is uh, within the scope of higher education, uh, we need to uh, comply with ethical and professional principles. Uh, so sometimes uh, they are well regulated, well documented in uh, policies, uh, which uh, will be addressed uh, further. Then probably we have such a question in our mind, then why do we need academic integrity at our institutions? Although we have several reasons uh, to institute a culture of academic integrity at our institutions, I'd like to uh, basically provide a few uh, hints uh, to you here. First of all, as we already acknowledge, uh, academic integrity is fundamental to any type of learning and teaching activity. And if we ensure it, then we will be able to boost the quality of our institution's educational provision. And then uh, by the help of this, we will be able to pre in, uh, prepare individuals uh, who will be acting in an ethical manner uh, in the society. So these are very important uh, concepts, uh, especially when, when we relate that uh, our graduates uh, will be Within the, within the society. So our ultimate aim of uh, academic integrity should be uh, relevant to uh, bringing uh, honest individuals uh, to the society. Then if we are questioning how we can institute a culture of academic integrity, probably uh, at the first step, we will see that we will need policies. We will need effective academic integrity policies. So uh, the policies uh, probably will be considered as uh, uh, blue documents uh, that will help us uh, institute culture of academic integrity. And here uh, I'd like to provide a basic overview uh, behind uh, policy theories here. We said that policy will be uh, will turn into culture of academic integrity and well develop educative policies, proactive policies, uh, especially will be able to uh, identify the responsibilities of every stakeholders and uh, they, will, uh, they will result in uh, culture of academic integrity. Considering the approaches uh, to integrity here, when we refer to Payne's approach, uh, we see two disc uh, discriminations. One rule compliance approach, the other one is integrity approach. In the first one, in the former one, uh, we try to answer the question uh, from the words of Bertram Gallant here, how do we stop students from cheating? However, when it comes to uh, the integrity approach, this time we try to answer this question, how do we ensure students are learning? Now, maybe we try to, uh, uh, we should uh, understand 
what type of policies, academic integrity policies, uh, we have in practice. Uh, it is easy to uh, categorize policies into, into three main categories. In the first one, for example, we can uh, make a reference to policies that, uh, that are uh, deductive, where the aim is uh, catching students who are plagiarizing, for example. And in the second one, we have policies uh, that we call as reactionist, where the aim is, uh, for example, how we should deliver sanctions. And finally, uh, we see policies, uh, pedagogical policies or proactive policies, uh, where, where the aim is preventing any type of academic misconduct. Of course, uh, in uh, proactive policies or pedagogical policies, of course, there will be some reference to the detection of academic misconduct and also uh, to, to the reaction uh, of academic misconduct. However, uh, the, the main concern will be the prevention of uh, academic misconduct. Now, uh, before I move to the details of uh, our FAITH project, uh, I'd like to basically provide a few uh, characteristics of higher education academic integrity policies. Uh, in, in their sections, both uh, Merritt and uh, Helen, for example, they made uh, reference to uh, contract cheating. However, when we check the policies, academic integrity policies uh, available globally, uh, unfortunately, we will uh, realize that many of the universities do not make a direct reference to uh, contract cheating in their policies. For example, uh, this brings a very important gap uh, in the policies. So, uh, it, it is. Uh, it, it comes with some uh, question marks uh, that we have policies, but uh, are they really well written policies? So this is this is very important, and uh, previous research relating to uh, this is issue, especially Irving Glendening from uh, Coventry University, uh, she uh, conducted several research and uh, projects related projects, and you see one of the reports uh, here uh, from from the Etinet platform. Uh, we, we understand from the previous research that, unfortunately, uh, not many universities have well-developed policies. So this brings problems, especially considering that students are moving across uh, universities all over the Europe or globally, and uh, academics also uh, are doing the same thing. Uh, however, uh, the practices, uh, academic integrity practices uh, at the institutions uh, vary. Uh, sometimes they vary across institutions, sometimes they vary across uh, nations, uh, but uh, there, is, there is lack of uh, standardization. And uh, when we uh, designed uh, Facing Academic Integrity Threats Project, Indeed, we try to uh, identify these issues with reference to uh, three important project results that we are addressing in the, uh, in the project. The first one, firstly, uh, we collect policy examples uh, from universities, uh, mainly from Europe, but also uh, from the other uh, universities across Europe. And then our aim here is uh, providing exemplary policies, especially uh, for policy makers. Uh, we already uh, finished collecting the policies. We are now analyzing the policies and uh, hopefully within a year, we will be able to uh, come up with our uh, exemplary policy examples. And secondly, within this project, uh, we are focusing uh, from a pedagogical perspective uh, for this purpose. Uh, we are uh, we already collected some materials uh, to prevent the academic misconduct is mainly uh, plagiarism and contract cheating here uh, and now and now uh, we are uh, in the uh, procedure of developing new materials hopefully within a year uh, we will have finished uh, development of our own materials and we will make them available uh, to the others and uh, in the third project re uh, uh, result, we focus uh, on uh, a support portal for victims of academic misconduct. Here, victim uh, makes reference to 
any person who is under the impact of any type of academic uh, misconduct. Uh, by the help of this uh, interactive portal, uh, which is uh, which is available now, I shared the link here, uh, uh, which is available here. Uh, our aim is uh, providing guidance, especially for students, but not only limited to students, especially students, uh, how to act with integrity and how to get rid of uh, some issues that uh, they are uh, they are issuing indeed uh, we are only providing uh, guidance uh, we are not an authority i'd like to highlight that we are not an authority uh, to solve the problems we are just uh, helping them uh, to deal with their problems uh, this is uh, this is the web page uh, directing uh, our users uh, to our portal and uh, uh, it provides a secure uh, opportunity uh, for the users uh, to interact with uh, experts uh, that we have in collaboration with NI here, uh, that we have uh, from the partner uh, project partners. Uh, and uh, we are helping uh, students and academics uh, who, are, uh, uh, who are considered as victims of uh, academic misconduct. Uh, apart from uh, these project results, of course, uh, European Network for Academic Integrity is uh, one of the partners and this project is uh, continuing uh, uh, the vision of uh, European Network for Academic Integrity, Erasmus Plus project indeed. Uh, and uh, we are organizing multiplier events. We first organized a multiplier event last year uh, in Porto. Uh, it was organized by the University of Porto and uh, it will be uh, the next multiplier event will be organized uh, by Chanakolo and Sigismund University next year. This year, uh, the European Conference on Ethics and Academic Integrity, it will be organized uh, by the University of Derby uh, this summer uh, in UK. And uh, in these conferences, uh, we are promoting the materials and also the other uh, the other tools that we are making available uh, to the public apart from these multiplier events uh, what makes our project stronger is also uh, learning teaching training uh, activities uh, as Chanakale on Smart University Center for uh, Center for Academic Integrity, we organize uh, Academic Integrity PhD Summer School within the last two years, and uh, we were able to organize uh, the last summer school in August uh, as a face-to-face -face event. And uh, we had uh, we had six lectures, including Sarah Elaine Eaton, for example, from Canada. Shiva uh, from UK, Sonia from Sweden, Teddy from uh, USA, and Zinat from uh, Dubai. Uh, so our aim was bringing uh, PhD students uh, together. It's not limited to uh, my university, by the way. It was open for anyone. Uh, so bringing uh, PhD students together because we we give great importance uh, to training PhD students uh, with the merits of academic integrity because they will be able to uh, cultivate culture of academic integrity at their own institutions. Therefore, uh, in the project, uh, we, are, we are devoting uh, much of our time uh, to PhD students and we give PhD students responsibilities in the production of uh, project results as well. And uh, our summer school uh, found its place uh, in times higher education and uh, also uh, so, some, some tips from the summer school uh, was published uh, as an article uh, by times higher education. Now, uh, before uh, I stop, uh, maybe uh, we need to consider this question, uh, uh, the developments relating to artificial intelligence and especially uh, AI generated text, uh, this becomes an issue. Uh, in our project, we give importance to policies and uh, from our previous experience, from contract cheating experience, for example, we already know that uh, universities may not uh, may not have 
immediate actions in order to uh, cover these important concepts in their policies. Uh, when we check uh, AI-generated text, for example, we see that uh, there are very few universities who published uh, policies, institutional policies relating to this. Some universities, uh, they banned, some others, uh, they encourage limited use of, uh, controlled use of uh, AI-generated text. However, uh, what will happen in the future uh, for now? Uh, it it uh, seems to be a, a question uh, for us that we need to that we need to address uh, in the future, uh, because uh, considering the uh, detection of AI generated text, unfortunately for now uh, we don't have uh, perfect results. I mean, there are some uh, text matching tools uh, who already develop AI-generated text detection systems. However, uh, they are not uh, independently tested for now. So uh, we are not sure about their performances. Top uh, universities, higher education institutions um, will be able to uh, address this issue in their policies uh, properly in the future. Um, uh, I'd like to stop here. Thank, thank you very much, Salim. That, that was really <laughs> interesting and fascinating. I really like your, your distinction between uh, uh, rules compliance versus academic integrity approaches, which show that there are two routes there for the sector to um, take action against uh, threats to academic integrity uh, and how it is important both to prevent through um, regulation and their enforcement, but also through educating education institutions and student bodies about good practice. You said, uh, I think something very important, which I really liked, the importance of creating and ma maintaining a sustainable culture of, uh, of um, academic integrity. And uh, you made reference to artificial intelligence, of course, chat GBT. Uh, that it does pose similar challenges to um, um, to contra cheating, and I'd like to explore some of the um, some of these issues with you further. Now, before um, asking Chris to take the floor, uh, I'm going to have a look at the questions which have been um, asked to see whether there's an immediate question to ask you, and um, and I can see one from Deb. Um, so I'm going to read it out. Uh, do you see potential in different pedagogical approaches to teaching and learning, especially assessment, to, re to reduce the demand side of cheating by reducing some of the inducement for students to cheat? Not as a bullet, but as a tool to reduce the problem. And I think it's, it's a very good, good question. It's, it, it, is, it is about as, uh, asking ourselves about our current pedagogical practice whether it is still fit for purpose in the context of uh, advancement in the artificial intelligence, for example. Do you have a particular view here, Salim? Uh, yes. Uh, meanwhile, I'm, I'm just uh, checking uh, for a link to a relevant article that I have just uh, published. Meanwhile, I'm just trying to uh, copy it and put it in the uh, chat box. Uh, you should be able to see it here. Uh, I'll just publish a paper uh, in the Journal of System, uh, which is published by Elsevier. And indeed, uh, I developed uh, a teaching writing model that I call as anonymous multi-mediated writing model. And uh, when we moved to emergency remote teaching after COVID, I tested my model uh, whether uh, it was working properly uh, when we move uh, completely online uh, without following all principles of uh, distance education. Uh, in my model, technically, uh, I'd like to uh, provide basic information. Technically, I use uh, my assessment rubric as a learning tool. Uh, I ask my students to exchange peer feedback by using uh, the assessment rubric as a learning tool. So they use a the criteria there uh, to provide feedback. When, uh, when they provide peer feedback, for example, instead of matching individual students uh, one with uh, another one, uh, I, I match one paper with three students. 
it means that uh, students will be receiving feedback uh, from different peers uh, and different peers with different background, different proficiency in writing. So uh, they need to question the quality of the feedback once they receive it and check from uh, reference sources whether the feedback they receive is accurate or not, which in, uh, in turn helps them uh, develop some metacognitive skills, some regulation skills, which in turn uh, helps them be, become, uh, become better uh, authors. So technically, we, we call this as scaffolding, uh, which benefits from because kids don't have proximal development, for example, and uh, in practice, it, it works very well. So uh, this helped my students, for example, uh, prevent plagiarism. Of course, zero plagiarism uh, does not happen. Uh, all the time, there will be uh, a few students who insist on uh, some, some type of academic misconduct. And in my model, I, I have some extra precautions to prevent contract cheating as well. Because I am following a process writing model here, uh, which means that students are submitting several drafts and they are receiving uh, feedback, not only exchanging peer feedback, uh, but receiving sometimes conference feedback from the teacher, sometimes individual feedback from the teacher, and then uh, they are responding to this uh, feedback and then act according to develop their paper accordingly. So indeed, uh, this becomes a prevention uh, for contract cheating because no contract cheating providers uh, will be able to act in accordance with the demands of the teachers uh, to my experience. Yep. Okay. Thank, yeah. thank you, Salim. That's fascinating. And, uh... Um, and I completely agree that some of this uh, um, new threat to academic integrity does uh, um, do urge the sector to think about different ways in which to assess learning outcomes. And you provided a great example there. And uh, thank you very much. Now, all this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, these threats to academic integrity uh, that, we, um, that so far we have uh, considered are uh, threats which have been posed to the confidence that the setter can place on the, on the value of higher education qualifications. And this takes us to the broader issue of recognition. So I'd like to invite uh, Chris Lyons to give us a credential evaluation perspective. Chris, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Fab, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to my fellow panelists and to the audience. It's uh, really nice to be here and part of this uh, discussion. So thanks to Inquahi for the invite to the panel. Um, a little bit about myself first. I'm the head of external engagement at ECTIS, and for some reason that's now coming on 16 years. Um, I don't know quite how that's happened. Uh, and during that time, I've worked in a variety of different capacities for ECTIS, and you probably might know us best as UK NARIC. Um, and then in 2016, that status changed to UK ENIC. And as Fabrizio mentioned at the beginning, with the National Agency, National Information Centre, with the function to provide recognition and information around international education, um, and specifically at its core in relation to qualifications uh, and institutions. Um, I am also involved with the Association for International Credential Evaluation Professionals, the TICEP Association, uh, and within that function, I chair the Committee for Standards and Quality. So. Uh, the discussion today does touch upon um, a lot of the themes that credential evaluators are interested in, perhaps from a slightly different um, perspective, but I think nonetheless very relevant to our particular um, sectors. So when I was asked about the question uh, and, and appearing on the panel, I was thinking, well, how are the principles uh, around academic integrity uh, going to link? Uh, and how do they affect uh, credential evaluation and the work such as ours? Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm probably coming to this from a slightly different perspective um, from the uh, inclusion of academic integrity. Uh, and that could be viewed more within the context of um, quality assurance processes more generally. And as I talk through, I'll explain how those processes build confidence um, in evaluating qualifications, uh, and by extension, built on the trust that we have in the institutions that provide those qualifications. I should say that I, I'm the odd one out here and that I don't have any slides. So you just have to put up with my talking head for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So 
looking at things then from a UK ENIC perspective, our, our focus is primarily on recognising qualifications, uh, sorry, recognising institutions. And does an institution have that requisite authority to operate and offer programmes of study uh, within the country in question? And typically this is focused around those within the sphere of higher education. Secondly, then, we look at the um, evaluation and comparison of the national qualifications that exist from around the world. Uh, and we relate those um, standards back to uh, local references, in the case of UK ENIC, to, to the UK. And it's worth pointing out that the underpinning principles of this work, both in the recognition of institutions and looking at qualifications, um, and those that define the ENIC NARIC function, they're all set out within the Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications Concerning Higher Education in the European Region, the slightly catchier title being the Lisbon Recognition Convention, or the shorthand being Lisbon, um, something that many of you are probably familiar with and something that was established in the late 1990s, developed by the Council of Europe and in tandem with UNESCO. Uh, and in essence, this convention gives provision for simplifying and facilitating international mobility. And I think at its core, uh, the focus is ensuring that qualifications and periods of study within different systems are firstly understood and secondly, do not then provide barriers in and of themselves to movement. Uh, and this responsibility on simplifying and facilitating mobility is placed upon the signatory country to that convention. That's the function and the role that we perform within the UK ENIC. And Lisbon provides that any holder of an international qualification must receive a fair, timely and transparent evaluation of the awards that they hold, and that that's underpinned by a principle of substantial difference. Substantial difference is something that talks about um, a theme of where a qualification in one country might give you access to further studies, that um, those same rights should be afforded in a signatory country, except in instances where there are substantial differences found between those awards. And again, the responsibility for doing this lies with the host ENIC NARIC Centre. Uh, and the recognition of institutions from a, an ENIC perspective, that's a process that is based on um, the different methods that um, occur country by country. So the process for recognising an institution um, in India might differ from, from that within the UK to the processes and, and jurisdictions set out within Australia, for example. So by necessity, the system that we had has to, have, has to be flexible. It takes into account differences between countries that are manifest in the institutions that operate, and then by extension, the qualifications that they offer. So how do we reach that point then when we're able to um, publish the recognised list of institutions and evaluate qualifications. Well, I think in accepting that status, um, there is an implicit element of trust uh, and an, imp an implicit element of trust in terms of standards, processes and principles. Uh, and I think it's interesting as a side point that when Salim was looking for that definition, presenting that definition on academic integrity earlier, those key words of standards, processes and principles were key to that particular definition and description. I think from an evaluator's perspective, uh, the guiding framework that is provided by this trust, by the processes, um, then sort of helps understand how uh, institutions can operate through what we might call robust, recognisable uh, and reliable accreditation and quality assurance processes. And very much within this discussion, we could look at the integration of academic integrity as a further enhancement of these quality assurance processes. I think much like an evaluation centre has to respond to the way in which education is delivered and the way in which qualifications are manifest. So two quali uh, quality assurance processes um, should reliably be responsible uh, and responsive to change with trends and current demands. So I think this is a key sort of consideration 
within the broader um, sector. So that's the sort of the, the, the baseline, if you like, the fundamentals from, from the, the UK ENIC perspective. I'd like to fast forward a little bit now, taking into account the work that we've done, it's underpinned by Lisbon, and look into um, UNESCO's global convention on the recognition of qualifications concerning the higher education, concerning higher education, uh, the Global Recognition Convention or GRC for short. Uh, and this continues that sort of link, if you like, and there are broader implications for credential evaluation from that convention with the implications then uh, around trust of institutions, trust of qualifications and trust of the processes by which individuals achieve those particular um, awards. And this does have uh, an effect on the way in which UK ENIC um, operates. I think there's a couple of reflections on uh, the Gl Global Recognition Convention. And maybe as a side point, for those of you not overly familiar with it, the Global Recognition Convention came into force in March of this year, I think it was March the 5th. Uh, and that happened after the requisite number of signatories at 20 was reached in um, December. I think it was Australia that was the 20th signatory, possibly. Uh, and now there's 21 signatories that are signed up. The Global Recognition Convention GRC is now fully in force. And I think this convention fully demonstrates that sort of central role that quality assurance has um, in, in the role of recognition. I, I'd say, in fact, that quality assurance is intrinsically linked to the recognition practices, and you could argue vice versa. Why? Well, because an, an award or an institution that you can trust is, is one that can be recognised. Uh, an award that is um, reliable and trustworthy is one that is easier to evaluate. So from my perspective, and coming at the academic integrity discussion, perhaps more from the outside looking in, I think it's clear to, to, to me from a recognition perspective that connecting the experiences that the credential evaluated professional has to those of academic integrity, quality assurance, and being able to identify fraud and fraudulent practice is, is really quite important. Um, one of the most um, sought after areas of training amongst our members is exactly within this area of fraud. How do institutions, how do admissions officers, how do academic departments identify that the qualifications that they've received are bona fide, genuine awards? And how are they able to assure themselves that the individual that's presenting them has achieved what they've set out within the certification? So, as a first point of reference, I would say that we could talk about integrity in terms of the recognition processes. I also see how this links to UK ENIC work uh, and that sort of crossover with the underpinning set of quality standards. Um, our members are also interested in terms of the recognition practices that take place country by country. Uh, and so within our own member services, we provide enough information for each country on accreditation and quality assurance within the databases. And I think, again, members would be extremely interested to look at the ways in which academic integrity is integrated within broader national policies around quality assurance. I think integrity arguably is also implicit in the means by which we award, uh, but by the ways in which we evaluate qualifications. Um, and by extension, that quality assurance is, is so integral in the process of developing and establishing those awards. Who? Perhaps neither of this is uh, uh, immediately um, apparent or, or uh, standout evident initially when we talk about academic uh, in, integrity, but from, from the credential evaluator's perspective, arguably, I see these are some crucial features that imbue trust within a system. Um, I mean, if an evaluator has trust in a system and the processes that take place, then the institutions that operate within them equally have that sense of, of trustworthiness. And then by extension from the, the evaluator again, it gives greater confidence in terms of evaluating the qualifications. And the net benefit, of course, is ultimately to the learner, to the individual that has carried out their period of study, that is presenting awards, 
and looking to further themselves within an international global uh, context. Again, enshrined and underpinned by supporting conventions such as Lisbon and the Global Recognition Convention. So in essence, that's fundamental to uh, creating the fair and transparent access for opportunity to all that Lisbon and um, the Global Recognition talk about. And that shouldn't really be a surprise at all. So they're just some thoughts that I'd like to bring from the qualification perspective, as I say, maybe a little bit from the outside looking in. Um, and as a summary thought on it, I think it just demonstrates actually that that relationship between recognition, which is the world that I'm more familiar with, and evaluation of qualifications, and then by extension, quality assurances is more vital and intrinsic to processes than perhaps is initially assumed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Crane. Uh, Chris, I, I see uh, yours as a as a call to action for quality assurance bodies, for a quality assurance community to respond to these threats of academic integrity, because otherwise there is a risk really that international confidence in the value of education qualifications is undermined, and that may have an impact on qualification recognition. And uh, you provided some uh, uh, really good examples and insights, also mentioning the, now the Global Recognition Convention, which is uh, uh, now just coming to force and which will uh, uh, underpin the um, uh, qualification recognition practice worldwide, building on crucially on quality assurance. Um, uh, thank you, Chris. Now, I've seen that uh, that there are a number of questions and I'd like to open up to the floor. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start to take some of these questions which have been posted and um, and please, um, uh, to all the participants, keep asking questions. If we are not able to ask uh, to respond to all questions, we will get back to you. We will, we will strive to get back to your questions after the event. Um, now, uh, there is this question from Sue, uh, and I see that Salim has uh, um, said that he would like to answer this question uh, live. So uh, I'm going to read it out. The association between cheating of any kind and valid, reliable assessment outcomes is clear. It would be interesting to hear from the panelists on how they see assessment approaches developing, transforming in light of online cheating services and maybe also artificial intelligence. This is some, some, uh, somehow a sequel of uh, uh, the previous question uh, that Salim addressed. But Salim, do, do you want to add something to it, but also the other panelists, if, if they would like to, to come in into, into this question? <coughs> Yeah, sure. Maybe uh, I can add a few words. I already clarified some issues uh, relating to my teaching model here. Uh, to, to my understanding, uh, first of all, considering AI-generated text, for example, do we consider it uh, as a threat or an opportunity? For example, uh, for this semester, uh, I will make an experiment with my students and uh, on purpose, I will ask them uh, to to uh, blend chat GPT in their assignment. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they will ask chat GPT to write their assignment, but uh, in in the uh, phase of idea drafting, uh, they will they will get some uh, clues from uh, chat GPT written assignment. And also when it comes to proofreading their own papers, uh, I am planning to, uh, include uh, some steps uh, to help them uh, proofread their assignments. So uh, as long as they are under the control of the teachers, uh, I, I don't consider them as uh, threats. Instead, uh, they will become uh, opportunities, especially in my case, for example, uh, I'm training EFL teachers, English as a foreign language teachers. So uh, in this case, it will become an opportunity for my students uh, to progress uh, their foreign language skills, their, their writing skills. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will, it, it will be the same all the time. And secondly, uh, I'm asking my students to provide uh, feedback uh, to their peers. When I do this, uh, I appreciate their contribution as a feedback provider. What does it mean? Uh, their final grades. 60% will be coming from the paper that they write. 40% will be coming from the quality of the feedback that they are providing. So 
uh, indeed uh, assessment uh, I, I don't uh, I don't maintain assessment only by means of the written product but also I include the quality of the feedback that they are providing I hope this helps thank you Salim that's great I can see that Helen and um, Mairead would like to come in Helen thank you you were first Thanks. Yeah, look, I guess um, maybe I'm, I'm more negative. I think back to the many varied assessment tasks I set when I was an academic in a medical school, and I can't think of one of them that GPT-4 couldn't have done a pretty good job on, remembering that it doesn't have to be better than the academic, just the average undergraduate to, um, to kind of be a, a wrench in the gears. Um, and I think what we've been trying to work with our higher education institutions to think through, because assessment design, of course, is crucial, but it's so much more complex than that, because just because AI can do something doesn't mean there's no value in having a student do it. There's value in learning to write an essay, even though AI can do it, because it's about research, synthesization, expression of ideas, editing, all of those things. So we're trying to kind of think through the distinction between the assessment for learning and the assessment of learning, because you need both of those things to develop someone's cognitive ability throughout their degree. So, um, and the other thing that, I, that I'm that i quite concerned about from a sector perspective, and Australia might be a little bit, we have very big class sizes in our universities. I don't know if that's the case all around the world, but you know, the, the workload component of having an academic mark, not just an assignment, but 30 pages of attachments, which is how I interacted with the GPT and the rigor that underpins that of what makes a good prompt and how am I assigning marks for this? Um, all of that, we're kind of learning as we go. The whole sector is trying to learn in real time. So um, we're trying to support the sector as much as we can through semester one, even just to unearth these kind of issues that we hadn't necessarily occurred to us immediately. Um, but yeah, we certainly can't put the genie back in the bottle, but I think we do need to think really, really carefully about whether there's something like a programmatic assessment that's going to be more effective in the long term. So accepting that you can't ensure the integrity of every individual assessment item anymore, but you still need a mechanism for ensuring that graduates have achieved the graduate learning outcomes through programmatic assessment. Thank you, Ellen. That, that's really helpful. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and I like the, the difference between assessment uh, of learning and for learning. And uh, Maraid. Thanks, Fabrizio. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I agreed. Um, it, um, you know, just listening to what Helen is saying, that there is an awful lot of talk and thought going on in Ireland as well in the education system. I suppose grappling with how um, I suppose how, how how institutions adapt and and, and deal with um, large language models like ChatGPT. Um, I suppose some is one one area that that um, a lot of institutions are looking at is, is maybe I suppose um, looking at assessing skill and competence as opposed to, to knowledge. And I think you know the assessment of knowledge is something that um, large language models um, can you know can can produce assignments in in very well. Whereas skill and competence maybe are a little bit more challenging to to uh, to, to demonstrate in that way. Um, in our in QQI. Um, or I suppose QQI is facilitating or, or leading a, a, a program of activity at the moment on rethinking assessment to stimulate um, that, that kind of thinking within the sector. Um, so we're funding eight projects that are, um, a number of them are looking at authentic assessment um, and, and ways of encouraging that within the system. Um, we're also, I suppose the, the aim of doing that is to try to um, develop communities of practice around assessment because we do see that as being really key to ensuring um, that academic integrity is promoted and upheld in the system. So I'm just going to drop um, a link into the chat to link it to that uh, to that project. We had a, an, a, a conference back in January um, and some of the talks are really worth um, re-watching, not least um, that, uh, that my colleague Sue Hackett led um, providing staff and student perspectives on uh, on assessment from a number of learning focus groups and surveys that we um, conducted in QQI over the last year. Thank you, Maraid. And, uh, and I think uh, your collective answers have, um, have also helped to answer another question from Pauline Finley, which was what modes of assessment are most likely to prevent pervading contract cheating? So. Uh, your, your, your input now uh, goes go somehow to address that question as well. There is another uh, question from Sue, which is uh, which is interesting, and I wonder whether any of the panelists have a view here. 
Uh, I wonder if anyone knows of any evidence-based data on the possible links between levels of academic language competence and engagement with cheating. Are these uh, inclusion issues with these? Are there inclusion issues with these? I guess uh, um, uh, the question is about, for example, people, international students coming to, uh, to the UK or Australia, uh, whose first language may not be English and that applies also for other languages as well. Maybe more, uh, are they more inclined to, um, uh, to seek the service of contra cheating, for example, because they, they struggle with the English language or with the, the language of teaching and learning. Uh, yeah, any particular and views here? Yeah. <laughs> There certainly is research that would back up that um, that suspicion. Um, I, I can drop a link in my slides before I circulate some of the papers. But yes, yeah, certainly the, the cohorts within Australia that are most correlated with using contract cheating services are um, young, male, uh, non-English speaking background and engineering. <laughs> those, are the, those are the key flags. Interesting. Um... Okay, no, that's really interesting. And um, should we expect another question? Another question from Sue, unless anyone else has a, 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 another input. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think it's well recognised in our legislative framework. So we we have we have our legislation, Texas legislation, and then another piece of legislation to try and protect international students and ensuring that students have the appropriate English language proficiency. Um, is actually the very first of all the standards. They're important, um, yeah. And it's so crucial that we don't set students up for failure by, um, you know, letting them in when they don't have adequate preparation, especially when the sums of money involved are enormous. So um, you do hear, you know, complaints sometimes of it happening, but we do take it incredibly seriously that the international students are protected as much as possible. Absolutely right. You know, very well said, Helen. And... Um, Another question is, should we expect in academics to have expertise in detection or is this delegated to a specific staff cohort once referred? Any particular experiences, particularly within institutions or what, what is um, it? What do you see? Is, yeah. Quick, I think it somewhat depends on the size of the institution. I think that's going to be important in a, in a large comprehensive university, <clears throat> like, the, you know, I think best practice is probably a specialised unit that has a collective competency. So a range of different skill sets within a central unit that are experts in you know, investigation, procedural fairness, um, detection, you know, putting forward a brief of evidence, you'll have your decision makers. So I think having that collective competency is important, but I think it's really useful for all academic staff to at least have an understanding, one, that it can be detected, um, it's not impossible to detect, it is possible to detect, it is possible to prove and to have a broad understanding of what kind of red flags they might see that should, should kind of raise their suspicion. And that, that content is very much the, what's involved in the um, Texas Masterclass that we're going to be delivering to our sector to detect contract cheating. Thanks, Alan. Um, Salim, would you like to come in here? Oh, yes, please. Uh, to my experience, uh, first of all, the lecture should be responsible for the detection. I mean, uh, sometimes it is left uh, to graduate school, let's say, for example. And in this case, uh, it may become uh, for these people to deal with uh, several several cases. That, and uh, interpretation of the situation requires some uh, specific knowledge related to the field and uh, graduate schools may not be capable of this knowledge. Of course, uh, it, it may require some interaction between the graduate school and uh, the lecturers or, or if it is undergraduate, of course, uh, faculties uh, and the lecturers. But uh, anyway, first of all, uh, the lecturer uh, should be capable of uh, his or her own capabilities uh, to detect it. Thank you, Salim. And uh, um, just like to uh, to read a comment from uh, from David Woodhouse, uh, relevant to what Chris Lyons um, just said, uh, is the integrity of quality assurance agencies themselves. This is a matter that Inca should address, and absolutely, Inca has a, has an incredible important role here to support the implementation of the Global Recognition Convention by providing to international education community confidence that quality assurance and accreditation bodies are doing the work uh, uh, properly and that would be of tremendous help for credential evaluators 
to uh, to inform the qualification recognition decisions. Uh, thank you, David. Um, there's a question here which somehow takes us uh, uh, beyond academic integrity, it's more around uh, lack of uh, quality assurance. Uh, for example, what can be done against dubious higher education institutions selling degrees in transnational education without reasonable quality assurance? This takes us uh, somehow uh, outside the, the specific scope of uh, uh, of this uh, webinar, even if it has to do with uh, uh, confidence in education provision and qualification. And again, the Hinka can have a role in, in filling those gaps of quality assurance. There is also another issue, and I wonder here, uh, uh, Salim, is that a, a legacy hand or is, or is it a new hand? Oh, this is a new one. It's a new one. Okay. Did you want to come here? Yeah. Although, although the question is uh, not relevant to this session, sure. I'd, I'd like to make a quick reference to sure. a new publication by Sarah Eaton. Uh, Sarah Eaton uh, with uh, Helen and uh, some others, uh, they uh, just published an edited collection on fake degrees. So I believe yeah. uh, I believe this publication uh, should should help answering this question. Fantastic! Yeah, please yeah, share share that resource. That would be great. And of course, there's another issue which is uh, uh, close to um, academic integrity, but uh, and it, and uh, um, diploma means which is uh, and it is also associated with advancement in uh, in technology, which is. Uh, uh, um, the reproduction of uh, the falsification of certificates uh, and fraud in certification. And this is also an area of work for credential evaluators. I don't know, uh, Chris, whether um, you know of, uh, of work that TISEP or credential evaluators are doing in this area, which, uh, um, which can be helpful for our participants to hear about and perhaps I'm post us to some sources of information. Thanks, Fab. I'll have a look into some sources later, but I think just to tie up a few themes, I think one 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 important thing that one thread that comes out of these discussions for myself is the importance of a community of practice. It's a term that is bandied about quite often, but genuinely, I think that shared understanding of best practice, um, knowing how different institutions, knowing how different individuals respond to different challenges, is really quite key. And the whole concept of sharing best practice is, is, is something that is embedded within being part of the NARIC community more broadly. Um, in, terms, in terms specifically around um, credential fraud or the, the production of um, fraudulent documentation, speaking from a, a UK NARIC perspective, as I mentioned earlier, the, the fraud sessions that we deliver are amongst the most popular with our members. Um, and I think it was Helen that was talking about hi highlighting um, best practice, looking at the red flags, um, picking out on good processes that every institution, every admissions department should have. I think these sorts of common sense approaches are, are really integral to the training that we provide. Um, and, you know, I guess another point, another theme that comes out of this is that fraud is unfortunately all around us, it evolved, it developed. And no sooner do we think that we've maybe got to grasp one particular challenge and then something else comes along. So I think that sense of evolution, that ability to respond it is quite core and quite key to this discussion, whether it's academic integrity or whether it's around the concept of uh, or the problem of fraud more generally. So, yeah, within within our sessions, I think these are the themes that we provide. And I think we're also honest in our fraud sessions where we say we're not always going to detect everything. I think that's that's by its nature inevitable. But what we can do is have a systematic process when we're handling qualifications, to do the checks, look for the red flags, use in the context of an institution is it recognised, refer to the UK ENIC institutional lists. If you want further information, use agencies, accreditation and quality assurance agencies in the countries in question that are relevant to that. For example, the University Grants Commission in India provides plenty of information on uh, the institutions that are legally entitled to operate there. And then, of course, if you're still not sure, submit queries, ask, and then tap into that community of practice that might be able to help you further. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Helen, did you, I see you, you've got your hand raised. That's great, Chris. I think that, that's really interesting. And in a, in a, for the Australian perspective, I mean, it's handy to have a single national regulator and we have a national register that's a you know, government portal that lists everyone who's um, 
registered to offer higher education. But of course, for our universities, they have self-accrediting authority. So there's no list of their degrees as such. So in response, I guess, to, as Fabrizio intimated, the, the increasing technology and quality of even just your at-home printers that can do a really effective job of um, faking a test statement, the universities in Australia and New Zealand banded together to create this, um, this My Equals platform that I put in the chat. And that is the trusted repository that has um, not quite all of the universities, but a lot of them and about 2 million users where employers and everyone can log on and say, yes, this is an official qualification awarded by an Australian higher education provider. Thank you, Helen. Now I'm looking at, uh, at the time. Um, we've nearly uh, run out of time. Uh, where, where, where did it go? And um, uh, of course, there is a voice here today which is missing, which is that of students. Uh, and they are, uh, um, in my view, and I believe this is shared by everyone, uh, a very important uh, stakeholders to involve in this conversation. It is about the student body understanding the value of learning. Uh, uh, once that is understood, uh, the, 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 the job for uh, teachers, quality assurance bodies, credential evaluators will be easier. And, um, and going forward, Inqua is very much uh, uh, looking forward to engage with the, with the student voice um, 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 uh, more closely. Um, now, uh, I'll just I'm checking whether there are any further questions um, to address. Otherwise, I'll just uh, would like to thank our panelists for their contribution, uh, in particular Helen, who stayed up quite late uh, in Australia. <laughs> and um, and uh, I would like uh, to thank all the participants who have uh, um, uh, attended and contributed with the questions. Uh, I remind you that this webinar um, has been recorded, so it will be made uh, available. And I believe the Hinkwe Secretariat will get in touch with the link to, uh, to the recording. And I remind you to check on uh, our inquiry um, future events. The new, the next inquiry talks will be announced soon. But of course, we have our annual conference uh, coming up uh, uh, soon in Astana at the very end of May, and we're looking forward to seeing you in, uh, to see as many of you in person there. Uh, with this, uh, I conclude, and uh, I'd like to say goodbye to everyone, and. Um, and see you soon.